between my eyes What do the find? Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders. We have Rob today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. We hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Go to Rise25.com to learn more. It's run by myself, co-founder John Corcoran. And Rob knows a thing or two about small businesses. And Rob Frowine is co-founder of Cabbage. He co-founded with the help of Catherine Petralia and Mark Gorlin, and the Cabbage platform has funded more than, I don't want to get this wrong, Rob, $2.7 billion in loans. Perfect. They provide an advanced lending online platform to help small businesses borrow the funds they need. They've raised $236 million in equity since their formation. They have 350 employees across five offices in the U.S. and international And a fun fact about Rob is when he was in college, one of his jobs was to draw blood, which he learned to do on Come With Host Patients. Rob, thanks for joining me. What's the most commonly asked questions to you? Is it what's the interest rate going to, what are the most common they ask questions from businesses asking Cabbage how it works? Usually it's, uh, can I, you know, I need more money. I need more money. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's it's and look, it's natural, right? You want you want to put your business in the best position it can be. So having access to capital can do that. But what we don't do, which a lot of other folks do, is they ask them, "How much do you need?" or "How much do you want?" And then they take them through an underwriting process, and and then they either Mm -hmm. tell them, "Yes, I can do that," or "Here's you know, I can do more than that," or "I can do less than that." We actually let the data. Uh, speak for itself. And we come back and we say, hey, Jeremy, your business qualified for $25,000. Congratulations. Now, you might have it in your mind that you needed 10 or you needed 50, but you've qualified for 25. And if you only need 10, that's all you have to take. What we don't want to do is put ourselves in a a conflicted position with a customer, which is you ask for 50, we have to come back with the disappointing news that it's only going to be 25. Uh, And we've done this based on our um, calculation of the of the right amount of risk in the in the relationship, and so it's actually be beneficial to the small business to listen to sort of what our uh, models say because it sizes it accordingly and based on what we see businesses of that size can affordably repay, repay and the amount of money they should be receiving at a particular you know juncture in their lives. Uh, and that's based off of you know many many now many hundreds of thousands uh, of loans that we've made. Yeah, Rob. I mean, a company like yours, like Cabbage, takes on a huge amount of risk because you're obviously lending money to different companies. Uh, obviously, you minimize your risk with all the algorithms. But I mean, there's always going to be a default rate of people who doesn't you know, don't pay back. I'm really curious about. If you can think of any businesses you thought this is a slam dunk, this is like absolutely this company is going to thrive. They're going to pay back in probably shorter period of time than what they say, and what ended up they didn't. So and I know all, you can't mention uh, all, names all, all, and everything. All the customers, but. all the customers who have ever defaulted fall into that category. Um, look, you really? know, you, well, I mean, you know, at certain point, you always expect that a certain number are not going to be able to uh, repay right. um, or not going to repay even if they can't afford to repay. Yeah. Um, so there's always going to be that factor, but you don't go into it. Um, you know, you, you go into it with the expectation, you know, you, you sort of have to believe that there's positive intent in the world, you know, that folks are going to do well, are going to, yeah. and are going to, are going to be good uh, yeah. people. And so we, we sort of take that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there were businesses early on that we took risks on. I remember we made when we were only a company that the highest lines we were providing were twenty or forty thousand dollars. We went to a few businesses, a couple of them here locally, and gave them a hundred thousand uh, dollars. And uh, well, I think uh, I'm sorry, there was like 
there was two of those businesses. One was here, and one was actually out in California, uh, and both ultimately defaulted. And um, and so yeah, I would say that um, I would say that yeah, we were surprised. And you know what, we we didn't really. Why did let- they default? I mean, like it comes to the question like why small businesses fail, right? You hear these crazy stats like nine out of ten small businesses fail. You probably have your finger on the pulse of that better than anyone. So I'm curious, what are some of the reasons why they failed? Um, well, look, I, you, you know, I'm sitting in my seat. I don't ever know for sure. Um, mm-hmm. I know the people that we lent to in those two situations were actually really good people because we knew them and yeah. we took the risk with them. Um, we personally knew them. Right. Um, and so, you know, one person got way ahead of their skis and they, and they tried to grow too fast. Um, that was, uh, one that was, um, pretty evident. Um, and so they, they took on a lot of obligations that they shouldn't have taken on. And, and and by the way, you know, I mean, I, I don't think our cat was responsible for that, but it, it harkens back to what I said a moment ago, which is you have to borrow money for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons, because you, you can't treat a loan like revenue, um, or like profit. You got to treat a loan like well, it's, like accumu- it's accumulating interest every day. So exactly, and, yeah. and a lot of people treat it like income, and you can't treat it really like, income. like they'll, they'll Well, just... there's, there's, there. I mean, you know, the, all of a sudden you got fifty thousand dollars in your account that you didn't have yesterday. What am I going to do with fifty thousand? Well, you know what? That chair is so ugly. <laughs> and I've been dying to get a new chair. I'm going to go get a new chair. I got like you. I have the money. It's only five hundred bucks, four hundred bucks, whatever it is. I'm going to get a really nice chair. So you go and get the chair. It doesn't. Your chair doesn't make a difference. Actually, right. I tend to think a chair does make a difference. That's probably a bad example because my back always kills me. But <laughs> so a chair makes a difference. But the right. aesthetics of a chair don't make a difference. Right. Um, you know the comfort. You can and, get a fifty dollar cushion to be on the there, chair. There you go. Help you your get back. a pillow. Yeah. Or get those beads exactly. um, that you put on the back of, of the chair. So I, I think you know one thing is um, again getting sort of getting. So I think there's this concept of why businesses fail. Um, yeah. It's pretty simple. Um, and by the way, I'm somebody who's had businesses who failed. Um, so I, I speak from uh, from a from a position of of knowledge. Uh, you know, you don't get to real revenue uh, either quickly enough or significantly enough. You you know somehow you know you've got to figure out how to monetize a business and how to turn it into revenue. The customer you know, flow is is lacking. Yeah, and they or the product market fit, right? So you're not you haven't quite hit the market the right way, or you're so focused on the ideals or principles of your business you you know and you don't listen to the signs that nobody wants that nobody cares right you know and so you've got to make that and then you've got to be unbelievably unbelievably disciplined about expenses and got to really know how to categorize your expenses track them over time and also manage to them so you have you, so you can build some trend lines and you know you're moving in the right direction that's when you know you can buy the new chair Right. Yeah. So when you get to a certain point where you go, OK, I've hit this milestone, you know, we we've, we've you know, we're actually ahead of ourselves from a metrics perspective. And I'll, I'll put it in cabbage example uh, if you'll indulge me for. a Yeah, moment. go on. We have four expenses in our business. That's it. Four categories of expense. We have the cost to acquire customers and and have them utilize the product. So that's one big expense. We have the cost of bad debt. People not paying us back. You brought that up already. Yeah. We have our own cost of capital which is how much we have to pay to borrow money. And then we have the other cost of what I call other OPEX, and that means non-sales and marketing, overhead people, tables, yeah. chairs, utility bills. 350 things. people across. All yeah, people. Yeah. So those are the four expenses. And I look at those expenses as percentages. of And you can make it, if you're a small business owner, they're a percentage of something. They're a percentage of your revenue. Yeah. They're a percentage of your orders. They're a percentage of something that's meaningful in your business. And once you understand the categories of expense and you track them as a percentage of something, then you can manage to them. And so, you know, we can see how our cost to acquire customers either goes up or down over time. We can see how our OPEX goes up or, or down over time. We can see how our not, you know, how our, our non-performing loans or our bad debt, how that behaves over time. And yeah. we can manage to those things. And that's what you really need to do. Mm. Uh, and And businesses fail because they don't understand the the top line and the bottom line and they don't they don't draw the parameters yeah. um, as to what success is that's a very scientific and a very numbers based concept um, and you know and I think people you know I'm, I'm like back and forth because I was always a guy 
Um, I've always been an entrepreneur. I was the kind of kid at eight or nine that carried around a you know a, a you know, notebook and I wrote down ideas uh, that I that I ever came up and I still have that book. And um, there's mm. many terrible ideas in there. <laughs> and um, you know, but I you know I, I I think people you know sort of romanticize the concept of starting a business, but you know ultimately you've got to figure out how to you know if you really believe in it. You've got to make it into, you know, you got to turn it into something, you know, that where you can, you can really, from a metrics based perspective, analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that, that breakdown, you know, cause probably I would think a lot of people don't necessarily know the cost it takes to acquire a customer, um, in general. So the cost to acquire a customer, the debt cost of capital and then overhead. I mean, I think yep. that applies to, to any business really. Um, yeah, no, I, you know, and I and I I totally agree with you. And it's so funny. I watch Shark Tank a lot with my family, and uh, which I love that show. Um, and Lori Grenier is is our spokesperson, so I, I especially love it. Um, She's but, your spokesperson. Uh, yeah, she is not my, my personal one. She's not going around saying Rob's great or anything. <laughs> she is the spokesperson for Cabbage. I didn't realize that actually. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So she's. Uh, She's done that. She's uh, if you if you're you know then we're we're um, shameless advertisers on many 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 uh, radio shows and so she's uh, uh, her commercials run quite That's often. That's great. Yeah. Now she's been fantastic. But you know one thing I've I've always you know they always ask the question or often they ask the question is um, what's the cost to acquire? Uh, and always. How much is the cost yeah. to acquire? Right. And that's really, it is an absolutely fundamentally critical. And by the way, you need to differentiate in your mind what the cost to acquire is when you're first starting the business and what your cost to acquire is when the business is up and running. Because you're always initially going to get a handful of customers or even mo more than a handful of customers pretty easy, right? Because so like when we started Cabbage, um, we'd gone to all these shows, right? So we were able to get 100 customers or 150 You targeted customers. the eBay sellers and the Amazon sellers. Yeah, we did yeah. that. But that's not 10,000 customers, right? That's yeah. 100 or 200 customers. So the question is, the cost to acquire the first 100 or 200 is vastly different than the cost to acquire the 10,000th customer. So you've got to really, you know, and I, not everybody's business needs 10,000 customers, but, you know, it might be three customers versus 30, right? So you've got to figure out what that is. Uh, and, um, and realize what the, you know, it, there's this, this saying that somebody taught me some time ago, you've got to figure out whether, um, the juice is worth the squeeze. Uh, and so, you know, that's one thing we pay close attention to, right. you know, how hard is it to acquire customers and, you know, are you asking customers to do unnatural acts in working with you? Rob, how do you even decide to choose or even have a spokesperson? <laughs> Uh, well, and then you know, how do you choose her? Um, how do we choose her? All right. So, spokesperson was. I have a. I have a theory. Am I allowed to curse here? Uh, sure. Okay. So, um, I always say there's a thousand shitty ways to acquire a small business customer, and that doesn't mean the cus That means it's very hard to find the audience, the small business audience, because um, they're everywhere. I mean, they, it's not like all the small business owners, you know congregate in one place at one time every week it doesn't ha happen you know and they don't also talk to each other that often right so it's not like you know, very you know siloed. You, like yeah. one small business owner you know their only four friends also run small businesses no in fact it's probably their other four people work in some large corporation or something right, right. um so you know my so my theory is is and you're, you're gonna have to repeat your question because I got so, so <laughs> no, on a tangent. No, I keep so going far. on a tangent. That's all right. I like I, that. Once, no, once um, my, it, I want to start a company you, called Tangents International <laughs> because of the way my brain works. It was um, how you choose a spokesperson, but how you uh, got oh, to Lori. Yeah. So, so you know, we so we we developed a pretty comprehensive marketing approach where we um, worked through lots of different channels online. We use some traditional channels like radio, I mentioned, and direct mail. We have a business development channel where we partner with organizations that have large numbers of small businesses and their customers. So we have all these different uh, channels. But, um, and I saw a lot of people advertising. I actually saw my competition advertising on Shark Tank because we oh. watch Shark Tank. Right, right. And then I looked at that and I was like, that's not the best way to advertise. I didn't think those probably, and I didn't know for sure, but I didn't think those were probably very successful ads. Um, but I thought the personalities were. And yeah. So, because you thought so, it was, I think where you were going with it was 
it wasn't like there's was a lot of crappy ways to get a customer and that was not targeting where the small i mean there's some small business maybe that watch it but there's just a lot of regular people so you're not specifically targeting small businesses if you advertise on shark tank type of thing absolutely yeah. and it was extremely expensive advertising and so we thought it would be better to partner with somebody like Lori, um, who, you know, is, you know, sort of the epitome of, of a great success. You know, somebody who started a small business, grew it into a large enterprise, um, has an extremely distinctive voice, but also is somebody who has been generally regarded as sort of the, the friendly shark or the warm shark. Right. Uh, you know, people love her. So and, she was on your, your top list, top of the list. Yeah. For, yeah. Absolutely, she she sort of had represented all the all the factors that were uh, important to us, and she represented mm -hmm. all the qualities that that were important to us, and so yeah. that's why that happened. And we tested it, and it worked great. People loved it so much so that our co competitor on deck signed Barbara. Really, but we have we have Lori. So there's that. How hard is it to strike a deal with a shark like Lori? Um, you know, I have to give um, Victoria, who's our um, head of sales and marketing, really the credit. She's the one that made the contact. Uh, she's the one that um, put that together. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty complicated. I would <laughs> and think by the so. way, Lori, Lori was, uh, is um, extremely involved in the process, which I thought was great. I mean, I had many, many, many discussions with her and text conversations with her going you know, back and forth at times. Uh, but what was great about it was she was personally invested. And yeah. so um, it's, her, it, it's her name. It's you her know, name, and so yeah. she cares who represents it, and she also cares that it's a su success. And I think the other thing is you need people who are, you know, because these things are not that scientific that you know exactly how you're going to work with the person, exactly when you're going to need them to do what. Yeah. And you've got to have people that, that can think a little flexibly, and, and she fortunately is one of those people. Yeah. Rob, thank you. That, that, was, that was great. Um, <laughs> I want to hear about a couple of success stories. Okay. Um, some of your favorite success stories from people obviously utilizing the capital and doing great things. Who are some that come to mind? If you can't name um, the company, just like the scenario. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, um, there there's a great um, there's a great company that's based out of uh, um, out of the near not far from Seattle. Um, that is a kind of a farm to table. Are you familiar with uh, like plated? Or um, yeah. I forget the other one, Blue something or whatever. Yeah, Blue Apron, I think it's Blue called. Blue Apron. Yeah. yeah, so there's a couple of those companies. This is a company run by two women um, who were in different fields before they started. And the, and the company's name is Acme, which makes me think of the Roadrunner. Right, exactly. um, yeah. right from, from, from cartoons <laughs> growing up. But um, they, they actually took our one billionth dollar. Um, so they mm. borrowed the, the billionth dollar that we put out. And so they won this award and we had this opportunity that we, they came in for what was called a business makeover. Uh, and what was really fascinating about that is I learned way more about business from them than they could have possibly learned from me when they came in because <laughs> the way they thought about their business was yeah. just fantastic. They, uh, they use cabbage to, um, expand. They were having problems getting a bank loan, but what they had is they had created this system where they sourced local products and turned them into sort of local meals. Uh, and I'm sure they're continuing to do that right now. Mm -hmm. But they basically built a multi-million dollar business, uh, and they did it in an interesting way. They didn't raise venture capital. They didn't try to expand nationally. They basically said, "We've got a source product from local farms and local local companies." Uh, and so naturally, if you're going to do that, it's going to you're you're going to be more focused in the geography that you work. I think they have now like five or six locations all concentrated in the upper northwest. Um, and the other thing that was really fascinating is they identified some challenges with the other companies that we just mentioned, uh, including the amount of packaging that is delivered with that product. I mean, you know, forget fossil fuels that will put an end to the environment before you know, fossil fuels will because the, like the sheer amount of styrofoam and plastic that's used is incredible. So they're also a very eco-friendly company mm -hmm. uh, and they deliver in these like wood crates and they have, they also build a delivery system, Uber-like delivery system where people in the local community come pick it up and deliver it to the folks mm. in a thing where then those people that's put cool. the boxes back outside and they bring them back um, to their, you know, to their, to their business. And yeah. They just built a great business, and they just had sob. They figured out how to put the meals together in a way that it could be profitable. They just executed really well. So that's 
that's probably the can the we mention their name or so we sure. give them credit and uh, yes. link to them absolutely what's the what's yeah. the well acme acme i think it's acme farms and table but i will get you the exact okay because i want to make I'll... sure whoever's listening to this they link up in the uh in the show notes uh the actual domain for them so that's great i'm gonna i'm gonna uh i'm gonna i'm looking them up right now acme farms and kitchen.com is that is that right that sounds did you look that up yep Acme and that, Farms is in, and Kitchen. Is it in, uh, is it in uh, Washington State? Uh, let's see here. Um, if my internet was not... Uh, it looks like it is. It's Shop, Cook, Eat, Acme Farms, yeah, that's and, it's, Acme it's Farms, Farms and Kitchen.com. Kitchen. Yes. yes. That's, that's them. Cool. So Phenomenal. do they use it to just expand? What do they need the money for? Um, um, I feel yeah, like I I'm talking like Shark Tank. Like, what do you need the no, money for? But, well, you know, I, you know, one thing they've got to do is they had to move into larger spaces. They had to buy, you know, better refrigeration. They had to um, source, you know, products that, you know, they could deliver, you know, the boxes and the crates and the other sort of, you know, l- you know more tangible ingredients that were in there. Um, so they used it for a variety of purposes. And I think they used it for a period of time. I, I couldn't tell you right now whether they um, are utilizing the the funds on an ongoing basis, but... Um, they used it for what they needed it, um, and and that's and that's really the key. The key is not the key is to you know if you're if you're a company that needs it for a point in time, that's great, um, and it's very episodic for a specific reason. If it's uh, I hear a little little like bouncing on the uh, is is our connection still with us? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, good, yeah. good, good. So uh, so bottom line is they they needed the funds for a variety of purposes and but I don't know that they needed on a on a permanent basis and that's a great customer for us somebody that you know again knows specifically what they need it for and it's to grow the business they're yeah. very uh, they're they're an organization that really understands uh, the benefit of managing expenses. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much for sharing this. I think everyone should check out the correct spelling cabbage dot com with a K um, and you know. Is there any other places we should point people towards on your site or on the web? Yeah, I, I, I think I think the only other couple things that would be cool um, would be first of all check out our blog. It's all about small business, yeah. and it's not pumping cabbage and taking money and taking a loan. It's literally just business advice, which is really um, hugely um, helpful. Uh, and then the next piece is check out Cabbage Cares, all with K's. So cabbage with a K, cabbage cares. We're incredibly community minded. Um, we have multiple events every single month hmm. uh, to participate. We really are big believers in like getting what? back. What are some of the events? So we've um, twice a year, every year since 2011, we've gone to a place called Camp Twin Lakes, which is a um, uh, a camp for kids that have terminal and chronic illnesses and other life challenges to do um, a lot of work there as a company. We spent time um, with... Uh, for uh, animal shelters, uh, with um, you know, uh, packaging uh, products for for the hungry, um, we've spent time in uh, cleaning up the Chattahoochee River. Um, so we're literally rafting down a local river here and picking up trash. Um, we've done uh, events with Easter Seals uh, for kids that have um, other challenges as well. Um, so there's been just a huge number. Uh, for refugees, we've done events. We've done you name it, we've oh, done it. That's awesome. uh, and we usually support um, organizations that are important to our employees uh, or impo- important to our customers. And yeah. so we're, we're big fans of supporting both. So is that Cabbage Cares? Is K A R E S? You got it. Uh, okay. But you could, you should check it out. It should be on the either part of the about part of our page. But it's just to learn a little bit more about you know what's important to us because I think a lot of a lot of companies talk about community involvement and, and things along those lines. Mm-hmm. We actually are uh, exceedingly proactive yeah. about it, uh, and we're and we're big proponents of uh, participating in the community. Great! Everyone should check out cabbage.com with the K and cabbagecares.com, both with K's. No, no, cabbage cares is just part of our cabbage.com site. We don't oh, it is. Yeah, okay. it's, good, it's a good point. Somebody might reserve it now, so thanks for that. <laughs> oh, so it's not cabbagecares.com. It's just a part of cabbage.com. It's just part of cabbage.com. It. It's part but of the company. No one squat on that domain right now. There you go. Uh-huh. I don't know that you'd get much for it, so <laughs> good luck. Thank you, Rob. Anything else um, that we didn't nope. talk about? I'm sure there's lots we didn't yeah. talk about, but we'll save it for the next yeah. time. Thank you, Rob. Greatly All right. appreciate Take it. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, like
like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.